Hi there, today on Typical Books, we're going to be talking about Let's Go Play at the Adams by Mendel W. Johnson. This is a typical book in that it is a reissue from Paperbacks from Hell. And I did go reading afterward when I was finished the book to see what some uh, like-minded people might have had to say in their reviews because I was staying away from the poor reviews and going after the better reviews. And I stumbled upon Will Erickson's site, Too Much Horror Fiction, which I've gone to for years. And I didn't put two and two together that he is also one of the co-conspirators behind Paperbacks from Hell. So it was really refreshing to read his review from years ago on this particular book. Now let's go play at the Adams. It's a book that you may have heard of from reading Paperbacks from Hell. It's often been compared to The Girl Next Door by Jack Ketchum. It's currently kind of a cult classic and the original runs are kind of hard to get a hold of. It was first published in 1974 by the Thomas A. Crowell Company, if I recall, which was subsequently and a much later date bought out by Harper, but it was reissued in the 80s. And that was by Bantam Books. Very, very popular as far as pop go. And I'll bet that is the copy that most of us have seen because the other ones, the original hardcovers from 74, they go for quite a bit of money hundred dollars on a books and other collection sites and some of them aren't even in that good of condition from what I took a quick cursory look but now of course Valancourt books along with paperbacks from hell have reissued this gorgeous edition that you see before you now and that you see before you all over Instagram as well because everyone and their mother has a copy of this it seems. I was first turned on to this book by Alex the Bookubus. It wasn't even my flipping through paperbacks from hell that turned me on to this book I mean, the covers are interesting and the chalk lettering covers are oh, kind of interesting too. But to hear Alex talk about it and to hear other people's impressions of this book uh, to a certain point, because I didn't want any spoilers, was what spurred me on to read this. I felt I had to read this, having been someone who enjoyed the dark and gritty nature of the retelling of the true crime story that Jack Ketchum did in The Girl Next Door. So that's enough about The Girl Next Door. This is about Let's Go Play at the Adams. So that's what I understood though, coming into this book, that it was some sort of story that featured a rape, perhaps a rape revenge, I don't know, you could only guess at that. And that it was very gritty, it was very dark, and a lot of people just couldn't finish it. I never went into spoiler territory reading descriptions though, so I didn't really know what I was in for. Well, aside from what the book has to tell you, I mean, there's a girl tied to a chair. That's your first clue. Tonight, the kids are taking care of the babysitter, menacingly. And they're just kids, it's only a game. Let's go play at the Adams. That's really all I knew going into it, is that it featured menacing kids and something horrible happening to the babysitter. Now that's really all you need going into it, I'd say, because you can also look at the uh, rave reviews, the scant reviews, the garbage reviews, reviews from people who feel it has no place in literature, via v those who celebrate this dark, gritty, transgressive novel. Now, of course, there were many books written before it that have a much more stark political and socioeconomic transgressive nature. It's not alone and it doesn't rise up above all of those, but I do think that it's valuable and it is well written. No doubt there were 100 novels just like it at the racks at airports and supermarkets and used bookstores. And I don't know if there was some sort of like ethical cleansing that went on in bookstores at a certain point, or if collectors like yourself perhaps had scoured all of those bookshops and these books just aren't as readily available anymore or if they were just very unpopular to begin with and had very low runs. I'm no expert in that, but it's it's neat to see something like this join our ranks once again. I think the weird thing there to me is that it seemed that books like this once proliferated and they were everywhere and now they're scarce. So the story revolves around Barbara and Barbara is the babysitter to the Adams children and that is Bobby and Cindy. They have some friends, the McVeigh children that live next door, and that would be Diane and Paul. There is another fifth friend of theirs, John, and together they make the Freedom Five. That's what they've called themselves. And you can have this bucolic image of children running amok in the field between their houses and having fun and flying kites and wearing capes and paper swords and stuff. Yeah, no, they're uh, darker than that. 
Freedom Five aren't really different than any other gang of kids. You know, they want some freedom from authority and their parents. And we've seen this in a lot of other stories and coming of age stories or just general fairy tales as well. But they, you know, want some autonomy and they want to live their lives their own way and they want to prepare themselves in their own way for a supposed fairy tale adulthood that is uh, breathing down their necks. So they're sort of ragamuffin near two wells even though they belong to an upper middle class society it seems in the scant descriptions you get of where they live and their parents means and things like that. We do know that the babysitter is there for a couple weeks while the parents are abroad and in the 70s uh, that spoke to a certain echelon but so they are kids that would get away with murder because they're not properly supervised and they have the means and they're learned and their parents are a little learned they're fairly well-read kids the sort of children that become a little bit dangerous left to their own devices like any kid and that's a taste of what i love about this book is that they're just like any other kids they really are and that maintains even past some of the most horrific scenes in this book they behave like kids, they think like kids, they talk like kids. So all of their machinations are coming from a kid mind. And we also have the voice, uh, while you're reading this, you have sort of a voice of the cooler head that should prevail of a teacher in Barbara because she's taken the equivalent of early childhood education and a lot of her training is going through her mind because she's not speaking to anyone about it. She's thinking this and sort of keeping information that she knows this knowledge about how these children behave and act and how they're reacting uh, to herself as sort of a secret weapon, which is absolutely useless. Now, even when the kids actions take on a much darker bent and that happens on page 10, you still maintain from the beginning to end this childlike reasoning going on and it's hard to not kind of fall into understanding their next moves from that childlike point of view. And there's a lot of passages later on in the book where they offer a lot of really interesting ethical arguments and a really interesting insight on society and the adult society that surrounds them and the way they think it works. And it's the sort of thing that you would find in a lot more praiseworthy literary works and things studied in school. You could also say they use language that maybe isn't readily available to children of their age, or they're regurgitating things found in these other books. Maybe, maybe not, you know, at, as you're following the story along, and I found that it was written well enough to really keep my interest and the characters are well developed. So I was really having fun sort of picturing what these kids were like and it's, uh, painted quite clear actually that it all seemed very natural and extremely dark even more dark in that I could uh, peg these kids I had an idea of who these kids were if I were to see them on the street now, these kids don't come by their insights willy-nilly they've been at this sort of edge play for quite some time and maybe it speaks to the world coming out of many world wars and smaller wars and the Korean War and Vietnam War at a time when these kids were old enough to understand the news, listen to their parents' conversations perhaps, and build this sort of idea. So instead of playing cowboys and Indians, which is disparaged of course more for its racial content than it is for its ethical content nowadays, they were into playing prisoner of war basically with a lot of feigned torture and imagined interrogations and the gamut of basically kubark tactics short of waterboarding now that alone on its surface level has the reader question this book and themselves and think quite deeply about the things that we allow children to see and do and that's just on the surface level we haven't even gotten to the and that is something I don't really even want to get into, not only because it is very sensitive subject matter and it does give away a lot about this book. I mean, you could guess that there is something like that going on in this book and it isn't very much of a secret thanks to the cover and the copious amounts of reviews that are out there. And let's just say up until page 122, it is a very tight tightrope that you're walking along with these characters and you're pulled along. And I was for one, absolutely riveted up until that scene. Like there is a harrowing scene at about page 122 in my copy. And it is 
so much worth it for the next four pages that follow and some of the conversation that follows aside from the character building and the scene setting and the tension and the drama and all of the things that are going into those first 122 pages you find yourself halfway through the book observing a conversation between the two oldest of these women kids in the house and they are talking about some very 1974 things where you can't quite tell if it is these people who have some very strange ideas about sexual health and attitudes towards sexuality and uh, what is sexual assault. These sorts of conversations are happening between these women and if it is their take on this or if it is uh, misinformation that was common at the time and it is just from this perspective you know 45 years later uh, very interesting to see this interaction that takes place over a couple pages after a very harrowing scene and it is a quiet moment as well and that's one thing this book excels at is this inhalation exhalation sort of feel throughout the book of having this horrible things that make you fear for some characters uh, followed up by some idyllic countryside and it is just a cycle of night and day as well that that keeps you rolling through the time and you're almost making a little countdown in your mind as well and it's helpful that you're very close with these kids they're very close with one another you get to know them all very intimately there's times where you spend chapters inside their heads there's times when things are chaotic and you're sort of head hopping and jumping around to their perspectives and it heightens that sense of knowing these children which is terrifying because they're kind of terrible at their best they're not much different than the kids on bikes you know kids on bikes saving our neighborhood the cobsons if you will i'd like to coin that term the kids on bikes they're not much different than those kids you've met in stranger things the losers club they're freaks and geeks they are othered by children their age, obviously, because they're all sort of together and alone and isolated. And therefore their ideas and take on the world is subsequently isolated and a little freakish as well. They have no parental supervision. And I think it's, it's well done here in that or the babysitter, Barbara, who's barely an adult, is the only real adult we interact with. We hear about the McVeighs. We hear about the parents of the Adams. We don't meet them. I don't know if they're named. There is a delivery man that comes from the grocer, but I don't, he may have been named, but maybe the grocer is named and the person that delivers isn't. It's very intangible, these adults around them. We get no real descriptions of them either. And there is an adult, one of the pickers, there's fruit and vegetable pickers that come. And that is something that hasn't really changed. Foreign workers coming to harvest during the summer months. There are workers in the fields around these kids' homes, but usually far out, and it seems to be early in the season for them. So they're expecting to be alone, and they do meet this one picker. They call him the picker. His name is Cruz, and we don't really get to know him. And I think from the kid's perspective, it would be best if nobody got to know him. And he is a transient character. We don't spend a lot of time with him. He's sort of out there on the periphery and a vague threat to the kids fun as it is and that is like the closest thing that we get to an adult is this equally othered feared person on the periphery and that is the closest adult we see in this book so it's really a really well used device and couple that with all of the space that these kids have to roam it's a very limitless book in that you feel the kids freedom. A lot of the insights in this book and talking points are things that you would find in Lord of the Flies or Catcher in the Rye and other books like Animal Farm that are read in schools and suggested reading and I, I can understand why this isn't but I really wish that we were in a world where it was because it is very heavy duty subject matter but the parents of those children I think it is highly recommended reading just like Go Ask Alice was very heavy duty reading for teenagers it was highly recommended for any teen that may have a risk of falling in with a crowd that is reflected in that book and sure that is a propaganda piece entirely I get it this however is not it was Johnson's only book he wrote it only two years before dying so he wrote nothing else and it is just really sad that he never got to see 
something like these sorts of reactions or really have that long form discourse. I know Kathy Koja often says that a book is a conversation and it, and it really is. And it's a conversation that never dies because every time someone picks up that book, there is a conversation to be had, whether you have it alone on your couch or you do something like this and talk about it or have those longer lasting conversations that live on in reviews and essays and critiques. It's terrifying that these kids are doing prisoner of war games to sort of rehearse for skills that they believe they will need in their adult lives. It is, that is the nut of what I took away as one of the most terrifying things, aside from the visceral physical terror that goes on in this book. Uh, that was just the scariest thing that stuck with me. And if you want a vision of what these kids are like without ever reading this book, you're thinking of those kids on bikes, you know, you've got your, um, Stranger Things type kids and your Stand By Me type kids. They're very similar and they have even less supervision and they play prisoner of war games and take it very seriously. It's terrifying. You could supplant some characteristics of Norman Bates from the book, not so much from the movie, but from the book where he's described so much more antisocial and misfit and dangerous. And there is a certain aspect of that sort of personality where these kids will smile and be polite, but what is going on under the surface, you'd have no idea and it's utterly terrifying. They could be any kid. So that is Let's Go Play at the Atoms. I really liked it. Uh, I neglect to give it a star rating. It kind of lives where there are no stars, which is one of the famous ratings given to Human Centipede. But it is tough to say. It enjoys a three and a half star rating or something on Goodreads, so we'll let it lie. With, with that and your own opinions because there are people who could not read this book. There are people that adore this sort of writing and really feed on reading things that reflect a darker side of reality they've never experienced. Or on the other hand, you have people who need this sort of writing to feel more comfortable with experience that they themselves have lived. And you cannot damn it for its gritty and realistic and very gross and violent nature because the world is fairly gritty and violent and gross at the best of times so it is just a reflection of some very very dark thoughts i'm sure but as we see from something based on a true crime case like the girl next door these sorts of things unfortunately can happen so if you've read let's go play at the adams and found it as interesting as I did and something that made you have a conversation about society for days afterward. Definitely let me know in the comments below or of course if there's anything that you think I ought to be reading let me know. Thank you again for watching and have an ooky spooky day.